All right, so as I said earlier, the, the Port Hills has been uh, the most difficult uh, and challenging of areas in the city to try and deal with. So the types of uh, fault for those who, who aren't from there, who haven't had to live with us, uh, cliff collapse, uh, rock roll and lateral spread. And uh, you'll see in the three photographs that are there, uh, rock roll is uh, in the top, oh sorry, okay, top, uh, the top uh, be your right hand photo is, um, uh, is it your, yep, is uh, rock roll and you'll see that a very large rock has scoured that um, land out in front of that house and then rolled straight through it. The next one is uh, cliff collapse where um, the land has simply disappeared uh, beneath a house taking, in this case, a large amount of that house with it. And then there is lateral spread which dislodges large boulders. Uh, in this case you'll see on a road up, I think it's on the summit road, uh, some very, very big boulders uh, in that, uh, in that, um, on that road. And one of the issues is, uh, has been trying to identify how much of the uh, rocky outcrop that exists in the Port Hills may be subject to rock roll in either a future big rain event uh, or in extreme dry weather. So last January, uh, extreme dry weather, uh, a rock had land contract from around it and then it uh, just simply rolled itself out uh, it was, I'm told, 40 tonnes uh, and could easily have uh, uh, killed people or, or um, at least done uh, more substantial damage had it not uh, stopped. So what we've uh, done over the 2011-2012 years is, is uh, reach a point where we could say to 19,400 properties on the hills uh, that it, the issues aren't there for them uh, and that continued occupation is a good idea, or is, is a, you know, fine. 511 homes, though, uh, are considered to be too dangerous to occupy due to those particular uh, issues, any one of those particular issues. To try and, uh, you know, create a degree of, uh, to be fair about it and to second guess it, uh, we did have a technical review team uh, look at the Port Hills land investigation in October of 2012. Uh, it took them uh, quite a long time uh, the next map will show you, and I, I hope no one's offended by seeing this, uh, the areas particularly where they had a good look uh, to see exactly what the risk profiles were. And uh, what they've come up with, uh, and we were ready in September uh, to make that final uh, announcement to tell people what the situation is, when we got uh, derailed by the uh, Quake, Out Quake Outcasts court case, and people say to me, well, look, these guys were uninsured property owners who were simply taking you to court because the government wasn't paying them enough for their uninsured property. That would be fine, but the judgment uh, said that uh, it called into question the way in which we'd done all of this, uh, this uh, the process that we'd used uh, in giving people this information and making them the offers. Uh, the problem then was that if we were to progress these offers, uh, and to announce this, we would be doing so under a process that the court had deemed to be inappropriate and found ourselves effectively in contempt of court. So uh, we're not appealing because we're worried about how much is paid to uninsured property owners. We're appealing uh, because we have to have uh, the ability to give people the information about the property they live in uh, and the opportunity, if it's required, uh, to move off or the comfort that they can stay there. So it's a very serious issue, and um, it's one that's, uh, I've got to say, uh, personally very, very disappointing, because I know how much work had gone into uh, trying to reach an end position on all of this. And uh, I hope that the appeal um, doesn't take too long. I'm concerned, I have to tell you, that if the appeal is not won by the Crown, uh, then we would be uh, in a pretty dire strait, having to find another way to do uh, what is necessary for these people. So I hope that the um, I hope that the court understands that these are not business as usual situations. It may never happen in New Zealand again. Uh, you know, please God, it doesn't. But uh, to apply business as usual requirements uh, in circumstances like this, uh, 
personally, I think is, is uh, somewhat cruel. It would have been okay, I'm going too far here, but uh, I will say it would be okay if the um, judgment confined itself to the issue of how much was paid to the uninsured property owners. But it didn't. It went well beyond that. Uh, so um, how, do we, how do we sort of uh, deal with all this? I, I'm flicking up a map. I want to tell you this is not a real map. It's a made-up thing, so please don't try and work out what property is where. Uh, but um, you can see that those lines indicate risks. Some of them are, risk, are lines that are developed as absolute risk uh, by Sarah uh, working with GNS. Uh, others, uh, other line, uh, there is another line there that is the council saying, well, actually, from absolute a bit further back, there is a lot less risk, and so we can have some mitigation that might uh, uh, enable those properties to survive as well. Others uh, will be just uh, so difficult that it really isn't advisable that people stay there. And I keep pointing to that uh, last January big rock roll. Um, you know, you can say it won't happen, and I'm prepared to live with the risk, but um, statutorily there are other people who wear it if, uh, if that risk uh, were to come to fruition. So uh, that uh, finishes the uh, formal part of the presentation. We're happy to take questions on this, but I am constrained by what I can say because of the, the uh, current case before the courts. Can I just jump in there? I had a couple of questions that were emailed to me with respect to zoning, and Jerry, I fully appreciate you may not be at liberty to give an answer to this, but the same question was uh, raised with me as to whether you would concede it was a mistake to lump the uninsurable in the same boat as the uninsured with respect to those red zone bear section offers? No, I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. Firstly, uh, if, if you go back to uh, 1990, I believe, uh, there was a liquefaction warning put on all of our uh, property land information memoranda. And I can, and I've said this in public meetings before, I can remember, remember talking to uh, my lawyer at the time, Alec Neal, uh, when I was buying a property, and he said, um, I'm obliged to tell you that this section is subject to liquefaction. And I said, right, what does that mean? He said, in a big earthquake event, the land could open up and could swallow your house, or you chew up your property. And I said, oh, very good, now where do I sign? And I think that's something that uh, uh, we've all been, um, you know, one way or another would have been aware of. I think um, that information will be something that's much clearer, and I think authorities now will take much more notice of that, particularly when it comes to foundation standards and, and uh, heights as well. But uh, in the uh, event, what we did for people in the red zones is say, well, you have an EQC cover that will, on average, because of the formula, trigger a payment to the Crown in the vicinity of 50% of the property value. Now, whether that's how it works out or not, that was the information we had at the time. So uh, we then said, well, that won't get people out of a can. We will make up the other 50%. In other words, outside of their insured value, we were providing them a cash payment for 50%. So the question then became with the uninsured property owners, um, how much do we provide to them? If they'd chosen not to uh, uh, ensure their, their built property, uh, I'm not sure there's a lot we can do about that. There will be other uh, philanthropic ways in which we could help some of those people. But um, in essence, on the land, uh, we were offering them exactly the same as we've offered people in the red zones. And the question is, when you've got um, now such a heightened awareness of the importance of insurance, not just here in Canterbury, but throughout New Zealand, were we uh, wise to cast the government as effectively uh, a default insurer, telling people that don't worry too much, if it really goes all wrong, the government will step up and pay you 100%. So my answer remains no. Okay. Uh, I think we'll throw it open to general questions. Uh, just to be fair, if you've got any zoning-related questions, we'll start with those, since that's the section we've been in. We'll start with those, and then we'll open up to general. Okay, where are my rovers? Yep. Yeah, um, I've got a property, um, it's been red zoned due to risk of rockfall. 
Um, we've been making great progress with the council trying to um, put uh, rock fall mitigation in. We've got um, the geotechs have actually put um, uh, quite a few proposals together. The councils have indicated that that would actually reduce our risk to the acceptable level. But Sarah still refused to change the zoning from red to green. Um, I'd just like an explanation as to why. Uh, well, um, because for the for the area, we've we've done all of our. Um, uh, first, you remember this is a uh, not a zoning in a the context of a normal RMA zoning. It's a, a convenience to tell people the risks that uh, that, that they live with. And while uh, you might make that case, and I don't know your situation, uh, the reality is that the area-wide situation hasn't changed. Um, sorry, we're living right next door to green zone people, um, and the, the reason why we can't proceed at the moment is because of the red zoning. Insurance yep. companies won't offer us um, yep. and I, insurance, I have, yep. and our bank won't offer us uh, continued uh, finance on our mortgage because of the zoning. Even if we have our section 124 removed, and everything, and we can actually get a building consent, we still can't um, do it because of the, the red zoning. Yeah, but don't don't forget the the uh, firstly, you know, once again, I'm a little constrained, but the line that is uh, between green and red. So if you're right next door to a, a green uh, property, uh, that line will have been struck carefully, uh, and the the uh, the underlying area-wide risk remains the same. So what are we supposed to do? Say to insurers, well, actually we'll ignore that risk, or to anybody actually, we'll ignore that risk and we'll make that property green. When it doesn't matter what you do, Once the doesn't matter what you do, the circumstances remain the same. The, the, the ge I can't change the geology that creates the risk for your property. But we can change the you form of the land to, to protect the properties from rockfall risk. And that's, that's NB is willing to res well, remove That's the not our job. <laughs> But Sorry, your, your you, job you, is to actually no, allow you, people to move on with their lives and recover. But you're you're putting you're putting something on us that is not our responsibility. If the Christchurch City Council decides to remove your section 124 notice, it's gone. So can you explain why there was remediation work done on Lucas Lane? Lucas Lane was we tried to do remediation, looked at remediation wherever we could. Lucas Lane was uh, one isolated place where we were able to. Uh, have contractors come in and they cut the banks back, uh, they battered it back three levels. Uh, the private property owner uh, on whose land that remediation was carried out uh, was a willing party in all of that and it was an incredibly simple thing to do. And that is exactly um, the same situation that could be applied to my property as well. Well, I don't, I don't know your circumstances. I'm just telling you what well, our despite general way several it, times of trying to contact you to ask you these questions, I've not been able to get a response from you. Well, that's okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't. You haven't got a microphone. Well, you need to use it. I can't hear you. We'll get a mic to you. <laughs> that's that's oh, better. Okay. Um, I'm in a similar situation to Tony, um, civil engineer. You say that zoning is providing me with. Uh, information about the, the state of my land. I have much more detailed information about the state of my land than, than your studies have uh, that you've used to inform the zoning. Um, I don't want your information. I can provide building code compliant structures to protect my house that um, avoid it being red zoned. Please just let me do that and don't cast dispersions on my land by giving it labels which reduce its pop, um, its value and make it uninsurable. Well, um, with all due respect, um, if you can get the 124 notice lifted by the council, uh, then you don't have a problem. Yes, we do. I don't because, see how you do. Because the insurers are saying red zoned land That's will right. not hang on, be hang on. insured. Let's do it. Hang on. One at a time. Okay. The insurers are saying red zone land will not be insured. Yeah. That and is a problem. Why do you think they're saying that? We don't know, Jerry. We don't know. Well, I, I, before Roger, before Roger does make a comment, it's because the underlying or the the overwhelming geological condition 
that is causing a potential risk for your property does not change because of your medication. There, there so is no, no underlying minister. problem with my well, land. I, look, I, I, is, I am a little familiar with your property and I disagree with you. But how, well, I, mean, I, think, I think some of you will be aware that we are at Sarah. You know, I'm aware of the plight of you, Tony, and also um, of what your issues are, and as well as you, Phil. So we are trying to organise a seminar at the moment for both the banks and the insurance industry so they can understand about the insurability for many of these properties. So if I was, if I was an insurer, I'd be quite happy to insure many of you, not all of you, because I think they are insurable. So at the moment, there is some misunderstandings by some of the banks and by some of the insurers. We want to try and work with the banks and the insurers so they understand that. So you don't have, so you are able to continue to get mortgages and also get insurance, so we'll continue to do that. We'll be really pleased. Sorry, sorry, take a microphone. Someone get a microphone to yeah. We'll, we'll be really yeah, I mean, pleased I mean, to have yeah, that yeah, yeah, Absolutely, Tony. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite relaxed that you continue living there if you don't have a section 124. Um, what we've done with the Red Zone is really given people the option of going. So, and what, but, so I mean, I go back to my point. But the, but the insurance thing has always been the problem, Roger. You know, so, it, it so does I mean, cast an aspersion. I, I'll be really pleased, um, keen to have this conversation with you. you yeah. know? Yep, no, that's cool. It's quite clear that there's a disparity between your views, Minister, and, and Roger Sutton's there. No, um, I don't, no I don't think so. You're saying that you're willing to support us, but you're no, saying no, that you're no, not. No, no, no. What, what Roger said is he's prepared to put together a seminar so that all of the people who have some input into uh, your life as, as uh, a property owner understand what the, what the risks are. My, my bank has told me that if I get my section 124 removed, they will still not provide us with finance. So, 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 so Tony, we've run seminars for banks and insurers before on these sort of issues. Initially in TC3, you know, banks weren't sure how they were going to deal with it. And I'm sure we can work with, uh, with so those. So TC3, yes, you've got a category where you've done some, some uh, remediation to land, but there's no, no yeah. such category in the, in the Port Hills. I guess, I guess the That's all we're asking yeah, for. Yeah. I'll do my best for you, Tony, I think. Yeah, I'll work really hard at this. How about me? Okay. <laughs> and Phil, I'll work really hard for you too. <laughs> Sir, promise. Look, I think um, I think uh, I think all that does is, um, you know, I fully understand the difficulties that you've got individually. But what it does is start to explain the huge range of complexities in, in the Port Hills. They're not straightforward at all. So look, I, look, I can look. I don't. I don't. I don't have a. I don't have a desire to get you off your property. I, what I have is to be concerned about uh, what are the overall risks and what do we know and what are we obliged to publicly state. And that's where it stops. So if there is some other arrangement then, uh, you know, and, and we can be convinced that the risks that are um, pertaining to your property um, are not area wide, uh, then you know, we'll see where Roger can get you. Okay, moving on. Next question. It's always been the case as it happens. Yes. That's why we had. No, no, with all due respect, sorry, that's why we've had a review. We've spent literally tens of millions of dollars trying to, trying to create the best opportunities possible for people in the Port Hills. It's why we've had the review process led by an independent guy, Dr. Keith Turner, and, uh, and his team. Uh, no input into that uh, from me. They've reported to me what they found. Uh, and uh, if you met Keith, you'd know that there is no way that anyone's going to get in the road of his independence. Well, that's what I would like to do, but unfortunately I'm constrained by being in contempt of the court if I do it. Yes, I am. That's exactly right. Righto. Next question. Yes, uh, Minister, could I please ask you to go back to your first slide on the Port Hills showing the three different property damage. Could you please go back to that for me? And, yep, nearly there. The one on the, the bottom picture is the rocks outside our house at 10 Hebridean Ave. And I know I do not want to minimise anybody else's issues that they face and continue to face in Christchurch. But as a family, we are eternally grateful that we have been red zoned, that we have lived in that on that property for 25 years, never a rock coming down. That was June, that was not February. And we are really grateful that we don't have to live there. I'd like to think that sometime soon we might even get our insurance on our red stickered red zone home. But um, 
I am really grateful that we have been red zoned. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Brownlee, Mr. Brownlee, up <laughs> yep. here. I have to stand up to be finally get a chance. Right up the top here, Mr. Right. Brownlee. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've got and, the lights uh, in my eyes, and my glasses make me a little bit Joe Nighty, so I'm sorry I couldn't see you for a minute. There. Thank you for your patience, too. It's a very good word, that patience. I'd like to direct this question to the EQC and the insurance about the frustration for our, uh, our children, the frustration for older people. We have a son who lives in uh, Reginald Street over near Travis Country. They've waited three years, fair enough, they, they didn't mind that. The insurance company said that it was co complete rebuild because of TC3 land. Then uh, they come out and had a look and they realised that it wasn't just a foundation around the outside, it had piles that had to be redone. So then EQC come out and they said, oh, you've got 75 piles here that had to be replaced. So now it's going to be fixed. It's not going to be a rebuild. So three weeks ago, on the Monday morning, they started. But hello, the insurance didn't know about the 75 piles, so they've waited another two or three weeks before they got back to starting the house again. In the meantime, they've got another house to rent. The insurance are paying the rent. They've been nearly five weeks in that house. Now they have to get out of that house and go to a motor camp and with a two-year-old um, toddler with motor vehicles around the motor camp, it even creates a greater danger. I wish A would talk to B because this is one of the biggest frustrations out. And secondly, thank God the winter's over because we have had to help them out with $400 a month power bills to keep the house warm. So I'd just like the EQC and the insurance to talk to each other so that our elderly people or the, our young families do not have this frustration. They're beside themselves. Thank you. Okay. I think um, uh, everyone would, would want that. I don't think there's much more that could be said other than the uh, insurers and the EQC are here listening to that uh, and getting first hand what it's uh, doing for your family. Okay, next question. Yes, up the back. Hello. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'm actually holding up uh, here Hi. two sets, um, two copies of the same sets of minutes released by the Minister of Canterbury Earthquake Recovery, uh, dated October, sorry, no, uh, November 28th, 2011. In the official minutes released, um, chat or points four. Uh, point 12 to 4.15 have been withheld. The second copy is a copy uh, re retrieved under Official Information Act. And just to paraphrase, I won't bore everyone with all the details, but just to paraphrase that, it talks about remaining orange areas such as South Shore uh, West, Richmond South, parts of Central City, River South, Linwood, Avonside and Wynone with independent engineering advice indicating that area-wide uh, land remediation is the only practical option for returning some or all of the land to a buildable state. Yeah. Now, firstly, I mean, there might be a reason, but living in one of those areas, A, I'd like to know why it was withheld from the public knowing, and B, are you comfortable with people getting houses repaired or rebuilt on land that apparently, according to independent research, is unsustainable. Because we have friends who are rebuilt on that land, who have had three lots of geotech, they've gone down over 22 metres, and it's nothing just, just liquefaction. The insurance go back to EQC, and EQC, nothing we can do about it, we don't believe you. Insurance companies say, well, you go and do your own geotech. EQC say, no. How, how are us that live on that land supposed to feel about that kind of thing? Okay, well the first point is, uh, where were those, what were those minutes from? Uh, all it's, uh, it's cabinet, uh, cabinet minute of decision. Yeah. Um, additional item, Canterbury earthquake recovery, orange zone decisions by ministers with the powers to act. Yeah. So what that's saying essentially is, um, firstly it would have been initially 
uh, withheld because we hadn't had any form of conversation or any public announcement with the people who are living in those areas. So uh, Cabinet makes decisions every Monday. Quite often there is a, a backroom uh, arrangements have to be made to make to put everything together before there is any public announcement. And so you wouldn't release those minutes until all of that is done. And without being familiar with entirely with what you're talking about, I know that there was, uh, you know, with the, the ministers who had power to act, regularly ask uh, questions uh, to make sure that when we did make decisions, uh, we had as much information as we possibly could. Now, ultimately, you have that whole story because it was released, and uh, I'm very pleased that uh, we have not withheld uh, minutes and or, or um, information. Uh, in, in any circumstances other than where there was uh, you know, natural justice involved for people who are affected uh, by those decisions. So Sorry, I don't, just I don't think there's, that you, it would be wrong to suggest there's anything sinister in that. Uh, I've been very, very keen uh, right from the start to have all of the uh, scientific information, all the technical information uh, out in the public arena as quickly as it could possibly be got there. And just one more thing, very quickly. I ask you, please, I heard you on radio with Chris Lynch last week, and you talked about, again, one of your favourite phrases, we've got to remember this was a major event. It is. Yes, but please, with all due respect, were you in Christchurch on February 22nd when the earthquake hit? Uh, personally, no. No, my family right, were. excuse me, excuse me, no, let hang me on. finish. No, my no, family no, were. no, sorry, let me finish. I was. I was slap bang in the centre, and a lot of these people were. A lot of these people have seen things that they'll never forget. A lot of these people are dealing with stuff that, no disrespect, you couldn't have a clue what it's like. Now, what I also will say to you is there's an awful lot of people here dealing with that, are finding, dealing with EQC, Sarah, EQR, Fletcher's, and Southern Response infinitely more stressful than the earthquakes. That, that's the truth. That is the way it is. Sorry. All right, Jerry. No, I, I can't respond to that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question. A big button. Yeah. Well, I think. Yeah, I think if you'd uh, listened to the proceedings through most of the evening, you'd know that that's a message that we have received pretty loud and clear from this crowd. No, I'm sorry. Why don't we give the man a microphone? He's going to hurt himself shortly. Right. Thank you, sir. Next question. Probably a very simple question. I'm just wondering if uh, any other areas in the Port Hills are likely to go red or not. Uh, that's something I can't say. Is that a maybe? No, it's something I simply cannot say. Next question. Where are we? We'll go up the back. Oh, sorry, front first. Sorry, yep. Um, a minute, uh, messi uh, question to the central government. What, have, what methods of community consultation to engage um, with the local Christchurch community have been undertaken to explain the future intent for planning and land use for the city of Christchurch? Uh, look, I'm sorry, we're, I couldn't see you and I didn't hear all of your questions. Oh, I'm sorry, apologies. Yeah, it's, you... I'm, I'm wondering what initiatives have been put in place to engage the community of Christchurch about the future uses of, and land zoning? to do with the um, blueprint and red zones? Well, the first point is um, there are still people living in the red zone uh, and will continue to be until uh, uh, you know, April or so next year. Um, and I've always thought it was pretty insensitive to start having a discussion about what was going to happen to that land uh, post their moving off. So, um, a big pun? Yeah, okay, good on you. Yeah, good on you. Where are you? Sorry, stand up. <laughs> I'm on three and a half metres above the road, Jerry. I got no liquefaction. 
Good. There is no reason to red zone my land because nobody's ever produced the data. You know that, Roger. No one has ever produced the data despite I have asked for it. There is no reason for me to leave my land. Okay, Blair. Thank you. Um, so the question is the question is about the process for engagement. The actual uh, land, red zone land, exclusive of uh, Mr Anderson's property, uh, is about four times the size of Hagley Park, so it's big. If I just step out of what is into an area that is sort of like my thinking, it's not government policy. Um, the first thing is, we spoke earlier about those uh, floodplain levels, and uh, the Mayor spoke about the Council having to think about some sort of a uh, process or mitigation for some of those uh, potential hazards. And remember, they are, they are uh, datums that are determined um, according to the best scientific information available. So one of the things that uh, we do have to sort out is the hydrology of the river, not the shape of it, not the bends and twists of it, uh, but what happens if we have a, a corresponding a uh, big rain event here in, in Christchurch. We haven't had one for some four or five years, uh, along with uh, some uh, king tides, not, not spring tides, but king tides, the, the big fellas. Uh, and what is the likely effect going to be of um, the low-lying uh, flood areas? Given also that the bottom of the river has also come up. So it's, it's two effects. So a uh, big amount of work needs to be done about how you create flood basins and uh, how those flood basins might become uh, community facilities, uh, community amenities as well. So that thinking is sort of very, very at an early stage. It's not part of government policy. I don't believe it's council policy at the present time, although clearly uh, what uh, Her Worship has said tonight indicates that they're interested in starting to talk about that. And I think the timing's probably about right. But in the end, I think one of the things that was very successful for Christchurch was the Christchurch City Council share an idea uh, process. Um, I don't think too many people would have thought that you could have had such a, a huge degree of commonality of thought come out of a process like that, but it did. And so um, I, I wouldn't be uh, uh, surprised if that's uh, the sort of way in which we might uh, seek to get that community involvement. There is a big opportunity out in that part of the city. Um, it can become uh, a huge amenity for the city, but it can also uh, be used to uh, enhance the areas of the city that remain down there, residential areas, by being used to protect them a little bit against uh, uh, some of those flood risks. Can I just get a Sorry? microphone to you? Sorry. Hold on. Sorry, we need a mic. We can't hear. Well, yeah, hold on, uh, just so everyone can hear, it's just as good if we get a microphone to the person. Yep. I was just reiterating his question, which was about the blueprint, the community engagement and the blueprint plan. Well, the, the community engagement with the blueprint plan was that share an idea um, exercise. Yeah, well, it was, but let me, let me tell you. Well, look, you can, look, in the end, in the end, isn't it extraordinary that there's a lot of people in this room unhappy with progress? It's got to be faster. But then when we uh, come to something like this saying, no, slow it down, we all want to have another say. It's a very difficult line to walk. But what I will say is this, that um, uh, the Share an Idea project led the Christchurch City Council to put together a draft plan for the CBD as they were required to do under the Act. Would you as a yeah, yeah, Mr Constable, I know that that's what your view is, no, but no, what I want to say... No, what I said is, what I said, well, the expectation was that the government would pay for light rail to the airport uh, and to all sorts of other places. That, I said, was not a possibility. Now, what, but worse than that, um, I, I was expected to sign the thing off um, as the minister. Now, I'm not a planner, so I asked planners. I've got to say, I spent a whole weekend trying to work out how you would go about building a building in the CBD. <clears throat> and it was uh, incredibly difficult because you had to swap between different documents, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
So in the new year, I asked a group of planners to tell me uh, what would happen if you owned this property. And I nominated a place and said, I'd like to build a building there. What can I build? And the answer came back, they weren't sure. They didn't know. So we could not sign that off. It wasn't reasonable to be able to do that to anybody. And so we engaged uh, city planners, as well as some uh, planners we brought in from outside, uh, to write that document. It's not something that I've cooked up. It's something that was uh, uh, designed to create uh, an opportunity for people to spin off. The key things in it are the anchor projects, uh, but I think the, the most crucial anchor project, in fact, is the uh, Avon River precinct, um, because that is the one thing that cannot change in the city, um, and we need to take greater amenity of it. And it will be a catalyst for people doing some pretty splendid sort of building off the sides of it. So um, at some point, you just have to say, this is it, we're going in this direction. But in the end, increasingly, the Christchurch City Council uh, will be becoming more and more involved in uh, that part of the city. They already have uh, 90, 95 per cent of the city, is, it's, it's, it's all them. So um, what, uh, where we go from here uh, is, I think, continue to see these anchor projects uh, develop so that others who will invest in our city can do so with a degree of confidence. Next question. We have had 11 assessments ranging from 60,000 to, to 600,000 repair to a complete demolish and rebuild. I'm concerned about how, many, how much time and money has been wasted in incorrect assessments. And my question to everyone on stage is, is it true that approximately $1.2 billion has been spent on insurance assessors? Um, no. So I don't know how much the industry has spent on assessment, but nowhere near that amount of money has been spent. Uh, I don't have that number in my head so far, to be honest. So in total, so I just you know, so the total EQC claims handling cost, which is not just assessors, which is absolutely everything, will be including all the geotechnical work and all the legal work, will probably be about 1.2 billion dollars for everything we do for the entire period. A, a part of that would have been the assessment work. And just can I say one before I do hand over, the other thing I would say is, you know, of course not every assessment is right. However, if you look at all the assessments we did for the 46,000 houses that we've completed, the difference is about 2.5% when you take out the subsequent aftershocks post the assessment. Overall, that's an amazing result in terms of the overall accuracy of those assessments. So individual cases, that there, I know there are some huge variances, but overall there's no systematic issue, there's no systematic bias. They're coming out pretty much spot on. Thank you very much. Next question. Go up the back. Is it clear? Please. Mr. Wizard, yes. It's not on yet. Oh, there it is. Well, I didn't think I'd live to see this day. I'm amazed at last someone is asking us what we think at a properly constituted meeting. So thank you, Mr. Minister, and thank you, uh, Mayor, for the, having this occasion, because I am really surprised it ever happened. We may have had to share an idea all those years ago, but none of them ever came back again in any recognisable form. So the issue now is not just about the zoning, the insurance problems, the EQC problems, which are colossal, but there's another issue too. The issue of heritage. For three years we've been meeting and trying to save buildings that could have been saved and weren't because of the CERA regulations. We've sat and seen most important landmarks of our own culture and our history just smashed to pieces without any real justification. I know there have been some, but it hasn't been convincing. Now, at the present moment, there are even more buildings threatened. The Majestic Theatre, one of the only proper theatres left in the city. Again, the Odeon, which the owner was to keep, and again, he's been told he can't. There's NG building, there's, there's all sorts of structures. I mean, in the air, like some wonderful dream, is the idea of anchor projects, which with heavenly choir singing will descend upon us at hundreds of millions cost, and we must pay for them out of the ratepayers' money. Is there any way we can discuss such issues as a covered stadium, possibly? Do we really need one? Can we afford them? There's all that housing to be built. The other one, of course, is the cricket ground in Hagley Oval, which was snuck through against all legal issues. 
and such problems as a conference centre, which doesn't make much money, and if it must have one, put it near the airport, I would suggest. But we haven't had a chance to discuss these issues. So I am so thrilled, and thank you, thank you again for actually opening up the future of Christchurch to public discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Wizard. Right, next question also, are we going up the back? Thank you. Yes. Um, we have been told by Mr Brownlee tonight about the risk in the red zones. This is a question for insurance. The insurance have said that they are offering a safe and a sustainable repair settlement or rebuild settlement for Christchurch. We're in the red zone and we've been given a repair in the red zone. How are the insurers reconciling that with Mr Brownlee? Why are they not respecting the risk upon the land and offering a repair in the red zone? Well, um, I'm sure Tim Grafton will make a comment on behalf of insurers, but uh, one of the reasons why we had two types of offer uh, was simply because uh, there would be, we thought, uh, houses where the damage was not going to lead to a rebuild, but the land itself uh, posed such challenges uh, that uh, it would be undesirable to stay on that property. And that's why the government said we'll buy you out at uh, your full 2007 rating valuation. There is just a wee problem with that, is that you didn't account for the anomalies. You knew there would be anomalies within that. I'm one of the Janets, if you like. I got offered $227,000 for a Lockwood home on my land. Now, because it's a repair as well, and it was a relocated home to start with, so it was an older home in a new subdivision, so it didn't have a good value. The anomalies stand out for people, and they are taking a huge loss. The, other, the only option we had was for a repair, uh, the, uh, the insurance offer, to get a higher value. And they haven't respected the government's decision to red zone land, that the land is too risky for home ownership. Why has the insurance council, the insurers, allowed repair in the red zone? The, uh... <laughs> Insurance, insurance policies uh, respond uh, to the way in which uh, the cover applies. So irrespective of where your house is located, if your house is repairable, then that is what the insurance covers in terms of its policy. There was a case, the O'Loughlin case, that went before the court earlier this year, and the judge in that case said that a repairable property in the red zone is compensated for on a repairable basis. The insurance policy does not cover your economic loss, unfortunately. How does that cover sustainable in red zone land? Well, insurers do not cover land. So sustainable what the repair, you offered the insurance the, people the insurer tonight is not, said safe and sustainable. The, the insurer is not repairing your property in the red zone. Your insurer is compensating you for the cost of what a repair would be in the red zone. I beg to and, differ. And, I was and the land is not an insurance um, issue. It's covered elsewhere. With respect, I was told my land, uh, sorry, my house in the red zone would be repaired in actuality in a public meeting oh, that was by a, Southern Response. Well, they told you that they were wrong. So there's a well, couple of points. A couple of points. I didn't take the land offer because they said they would repair my home in the red zone, which no. was a voluntary offer. It was a voluntary offer. I got told I could be repaired in actuality with Mr well, Rose okay. in the room. I don't know how much you want to tell us this evening, sharing your details. I'm just asking why, how come, what is repair in the red zone? How does the insurers reconcile that with sustainability? 
Well, look, I can't well, answer for the insurance. Well, well I'm not asking you. I was asking the insurance. Well, the, 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 the answer is, is that the insurers are not insuring properties in the red zone. Uh, we are insuring you did, prop. We are. Uh, sorry. You did prior. So I'm not asking red, um, insurance after. What I am asking you now: How can that be sustainable? I was insured before. You are offering a repair now. I should be able to have insurance in the red zone if you are offering me a repair. No, there is not insurance in the red zone because the red zone designates that that is a high risk area that insurers Why will not the go insurers into. Why are the insurers offering to repair me then? You know, that's no. a mistake. They shouldn't have done that. And I think um, uh, they have. Well, okay, but uh, we've got the port hills to come. Are some of them going to be repair in the red zone as well? What? What? Uh, I can only offer, and people will no doubt draw breath and moan and everything else, is if you talk to us uh, to give us a few more details, we can look into that situation and see exactly what the problem There's is. There's so many people in the red zone. Okay, well, no, no, with all due respect, no. no, I'm sorry, with all due respect, that is not true. We, oh, we can, I'm sorry. I'm in Brooklands. The numbers, the numbers that, uh, are, who have taken the Crown offer or are in settlement do not bear that out to be the truth. All right. We've got to move on. Ma'am, Peter Rose... So, no answer. Thank you. Ma'am, can I just say to you, Peter Rose is here. So at the end of our general session at 9.30, if you wish to have a personal discussion with him... Well, the, op the offer's there, OK? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Let's move on. We'll go up here. Question about um, rock full uh, mitigation. And was wondering how come if I had a commercial enterprise such as, like, say, a gondola, um, that I could mitigate the rock fall and open the enterprise and have public coming through my business. And, um, but if I have a private house that I want to mitigate, then um, I'm not allowed to mitigate that and have the red zone removed so that I can um, you know, move on with my life, build a house. Um, I've removed the risk of uh, the life risk by having mitigation to engineering works, but it's still red zoned and it can't be occupied. Whereas if I have a gondola that's got rock full, I can mitigate that, and that sort of works fine. Well, it's a matter of what the mitigation was for and where it was. And if you go down there and have a look at that, uh, they've put uh, some mitigation uh, high up on the hill, uh, which was initially to protect a, a, a dwelling that existed above the car park. But that, uh, we haven't accepted that. Thank you very much. Question down the front, yes. Hi, I just wanted to um, follow up on the lady before. We have a property in the red zone, and um, our question is, right, the insurers uh, have said that it's a repair, right? We want to know how do they assess, um, like, the foundations? Are they responsible for actually repairing the foundations of that property? Because if they are, then they haven't added that in to, to what they've offered us, into the claim. And, um, and the other thing is, like, do they need to meet the compliance of the flood? If, if, they're, if they're building a um, new floor, yes. So the repair, what, what we're trying to establish is that, okay, the insurance company is telling us it's a repair. The engineers are telling us it needs to be, it's, it's a whole new foundation that needs to be um, put in. These, but the insurance these, company... Are these, sorry, are these your engineers who you've engaged separately or how's it worked? Well, we've had to get another, an independent engineer in hmm. and now the insurance company is saying, OK, you've got your report, we're going to get another independent engineering to have a look at the structure of Who's the property. Who's your insurer? Who's your insurer? State. State. IAG. Jackie Johnson is your woman. Thank you. <laughs> um, can you come and see Jackie after at 9.30? We'll um, happily liaise there. Tim, did you want to comment? Well, no, that probably uh, answers the question, but I mean, essentially, uh, if you're in the red zone and you've got a repairable property, it's the notional cost of that repair that's being addressed, which is what your policy responds to. Well, well so, sorry, this individual, this individual lady's uh, issue is one that is a case 
that will be talked about, but unless you're talking about a, her case, then I think that's one that needs to be. Well, well, look, it's, uh, your, your individual case probably needs to be addressed with your particular insurer, but I mean, the principle that we talk about is that the repairable property in the red zone uh, is costed in, as a notional repair. Well, the, no, no, the sustainability is about having properties that will in the future last decades and will be insurable in the future. And that means building properties not in the red zone, but building properties in where the land is good and building high quality houses uh, that will be able to be there for years to come. That is what's sustainable well, well, look, and safe. I'm sorry, but... Yeah. No. No, what, what I'm saying is your insurance policy was never written anticipating a red zone, but that is what, but that is what your okay, policy I'm is. Sorry, look, we're not going to have on. this argument here. It's, well, no, you've come here to hear general information. You, need, you have an opportunity to come and speak to your insurer after this event, and uh, we would want them to be able to do that. We don't know your full circumstances. I don't know where you live or what's going on. I can't respond, and I can't ask Mr. Grafton to do that, but you can have that discussion with your insurer, the man okay. behind you. Yeah. No, yep. I think, Thank you, I think I just well, wanted, what I put to you is that no houses in the red zone are being repaired. Yes, I wonder sir. if I could just change the, uh, the topic. Sure. It's, it's been a pretty long night, and I don't want to trivialise some of the real concerns and issues at all. But, you know, if, if there is post-traumatic stress. There's also post-traumatic growth. Let's just hear a little bit of the other story. Mayor Dal Dalziel said before, she talked about resilience, getting beyond the cliche, bounce back, new ways of doing things and so forth. Just before we go, and it's still our, our collective throats, I'd like to hear a little bit more from Leanne, and perhaps from David Ayer, about what some of those, those new growth areas are. So what's the new city going to look like? What are some of the new visions? So we can, we can leave here with not just the issues and problems, but with some idea of making this city a better place than before the quakes. Okay, well, I'm just going to invite the minister to stand here with me because this is why we came together. And, you know, I'm not going to um, focus on the past. I understand where people are at, and we actually have to respect that. Not everybody in the room is in the same place. Some people have been able to move on. A lot of people haven't been able to move on. But what we have to do collectively, collaboratively, together, is actually work out what's standing in the way of those that haven't been able to move on. And that's what today was about, and um, I mean, the Minister probably doesn't know what I campaigned on, but one of the things I campaigned on was um, that the, maybe the Council can play a, 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 a role as a broker, because we are not responsible for all of the elements, and the Minister's not responsible for all of the elements, and the private sector insurers are not responsible for all of the elements, but together we are collectively responsible. So maybe we could bring all of the parties together. We could actually, as a, as a group, and but high level, you know, minister, mayor, um, you know, the chief executive, the, the chair of the boards, bring them together and actually let's, let's do a mapping of what those problems are, identify what, how they can be resolved. Are there, in fact, um, some agreed solutions? So, you know, a lot of the conversations that I've had with people are about, you know, the repair solutions. Are they appropriate um, for that um, sustainable environment that we're looking for into the future? Um, are there uh, outstanding issues with respect to the residential red zone? You know, are there these issues that we can address are there issues that actually require a legal decision? 
I mean, EQC and the insurance industry went to court by agreement. That's what a declaratory judgment is. If there are court issues, rather than leaving them to individuals to take to court, could we in fact take a couple of test cases and resolve those <laughs> issues? Um, I'm not... I'm not going to the solution before we've had the conversation. I'm just saying that it's really important that we um, work together to find these solutions because, quite frankly, the future is incredibly exciting. And I keep saying this, we're building the newest city in the world. But if people are stuck in their awful environment and they cannot see their way out of it, they can't join in the excitement of designing that new city. So I really want us to find solutions to these issues together and then invite the rest of the city maybe to come involved in a new form of share an idea where we do it together instead of separately. <laughs> David. Well, uh, oh, David, yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, sorry. Mayor of... Uh, uh, I'm Akariri. the Waimakariri district as well. Um, we've got a thousand uh, properties red zoned in Kaapui, Pines and Karaki, which is probably proportionately as bad as or worse than Christchurch. What we don't have is the rockfall issues. Um, we don't have too many mountains around, uh, around Kaapui. But I, I, I think, um, apart from the bricks and mortar stuff that uh, both councils have to do, I think our main job is building community. We, we've got a, um, a a district that is rapidly changing. We're used to change, but we've never had the kind of change that we've experienced over the last two years. And uh, we've got people who have relocated within our within our district. A lot of people in Kaapoi said they wanted to stay in Kaapoi. We tried very hard to make that possible. But also, uh, we've got a lot of people who have come from Christchurch, as I did uh, 40 odd years ago. So. Um, I think our job is to uh, integrate uh, those newcomers into our Kaapoi, Rangiora, Pegasus, Woody and communities to, uh, uh, to help them uh, come as part of a community that is already very strong, but it's uh, a community that is responding to change the best way it can. And speaking on behalf of the Mayor of Selwyn, who's unable to be here this evening, Alan Sensational Selwyn, as I like to call it, um, Sensational Selwyn District, the solid piece of Canterbury. We, you know, the, the first earthquake was there, but it wasn't really our fault. <laughs> we, uh, we also, Christchurch is our city. Whether you're in Selwyn or Waimak, Huranui or wherever, Christchurch is our city. And it's always been our city. It's where we've gone to be educated. It's where we've gone to recreate. It's where we've gone to out for an ice meal or whatever we may have done. And I think going forward in Canterbury, we all want to see Christchurch go uh, together as a, as a community, as all of our communities working together. Whether we are seeing a lot of growth, as we are in Selwyn, we have 7,000 sections on the market because we were able to, to work within the urban development strategy framework early and we have a sewerage system out there to cope. We've got Rolleston growing like Topsy and Lincoln and Pribbleton both growing close to, the, close to the city. But we do want to see uh, the whole of Canterbury grow because it is our city that is our future. So I think uh, all working together and collaborating as we are seeing tonight and hoping to do that through the Urban Development Strategy with our partners with ECAN, Naitahu, Christchurch City of Waimak, uh, we can do that. So uh, there is a lot of hope for your question up there about where we're going. Um, there is a lot of hope, there's a lot of new growth, a lot of areas for people to move to, and we are seeing a lot of relocation. So, come on out. <laughs> Just very quickly, yep, we are running out of time. Yes, this, Just might be, uh, this might be the last the question. Last one for the yeah. night. Yeah. Are we working? Yep, final question. Right, Leanne. Vision for the future, it might uh, throw the cat amongst the pigeons, New Brighton. Even though I don't live that there, but I have fond memories there, I live out at Hornby. The vision I see for New Brighton, knock all those eyesore shops down, <laughs> build a beautiful big mall for the future for our young people where they gather, <laughs> a theatre, have glass, safety glass petition all the way along with the promenade to cut out that easterly. <laughs> 
build our salt water uh, pools and, and the uh, landslides and all that, and I think you'll see you bright and grow. Is this possible with the way the land has been sinking? I, well, <laughs> the, let, me, let me just say that what, what our councils started to talk about and um, it is something called co-creation. And uh, I don't know if you realise this, but the Share an Idea campaign won the Christchurch City Council an award for co-creation. But it was the beginning of a process. It wasn't the end. And I think that we actually have to go back to it and remember that what Share an Idea was was it was about providing a range of different platforms for different groups of people to be able to have their say about what they wanted to achieve. So if we were looking for some highlights of what Share and Idea um, said that the people wanted for the city, they wanted it to be clean, green, safe, accessible and smart. I think that's probably a fair summary of what Share and Idea produced. But if we're going to imagine what the future of Brighton would be, well, yeah, I've got tons of ideas what the future of Brighton would be. I had my office there for a number of years. But it's not up to one person or one idea. It's actually up to collaborating and co-creating the environment that you want in your own area. And so I think that we should be working in our community board areas and every single member of the council has run on the basis of devolving more responsibility back to their community boards to work in collaboration and partnership with their local communities to co-create the kind of community, as David quite rightly said, we want to have. Part of that is about our physical assets, but much more of it is about our um, natural and our human assets. And if we put the creative energy that I know that Share an Idea produced into our localities, I think the Minister put it really well that the East actually could provide some enormous amenity to the whole city and I often think it will drive the recovery of the city in so many ways if we actually open up our eyes to all of the possibilities. All right. Yeah, so uh, glass promenade along the uh, Brighton foreshore. You're not a window cleaner by any chance, are you? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, that is uh, totally out of my jurisdiction, but I know the Mayor's just taken that on board and uh, probably action at the Council meeting on Thursday. Uh, look, I think, um, sorry? Well, we've both got both central and local government. Sorry, where's that coming from? Oh, oh yeah, sorry, yep. Yeah. Um, from the Avondale Residents Association. The Avondale area is the bulk of it in the 50-year flood zone. Really pleased to see, hear both central and local government refer to the flood zone issues. What we've got is the line between red and green was conveniently down the white line in the middle of a road. So that made the road, the land, quite fine the other side, the white line. The fact that all the houses have to go up one, 1.2 metres, according to the consenting documentation. Now we've got to the point where the first rebuilds are talking with insurance companies. Insurance companies are saying, oh no madam, we'll build you at your existing level using existing rights. Now, having talked then to people at the City Council consenting department, supposedly they can use existing rights and not have to have the expense of building sections up 1 to 1.2 metres. Uh, we're confused. If the rules are there to make that happen, how come they can seem to be ignored when it suits? Okay. Well, look, that's an issue the council needs to get sorted out, and the mayor's given the undertaking tonight that that's what they're going to do. But don't don't discount what uh, two things. Firstly, uh, if that were to happen, all, all the rebuilds uh, are raised up, uh, the 1.2, whatever it is, and there was a flood, then you do create a Venice-type situation. Some dry areas, some wet. So that issue I spoke of before about dealing with the hydrology of the river uh, and the, the uh, uh, water table uh, beneath those uh, suburbs is, I think, of paramount importance in trying to work out a solution for the future. 
uh, because you can change those things and you can uh, mitigate that risk on a very, very broad scale without having to um, dislocate a neighbourhood with uh, uh, some buildings that are, that are you know, substantially higher up uh, than others. So it's a, it is a complex question, but both the Mayor and I are very aware of the need to uh, uh, reach some solutions there. Okay, on that note, we are going to wrap up. I've got a couple of quick messages Hello. to uh, make. Uh, Jerry, I'll let you wrap up first of all. Yes? Well, look, um, I, I just want to uh, thank people very much uh, for coming out tonight. I want to thank you very much for the hearing uh, that you've given us. I know that uh, you know, the issues that you've raised won't, aren't satisfied by a public meeting. That's not uh, likely to be the case. But if you think about what the Mayor said about uh, thinking for the future and trying to collectively solve problems, we have selectively, uh, collectively solved a huge number of problems in this city. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> well, well, she... Um, yeah, look, if, if, I, if I made a, a slip, I was quite sure she said the way through the future was more procreation. So um, <laughs> I'll do it when she does. Anyway, um, the, the real point is that we have solved a lot of problems along the way, and we have done that very collectively. And, it, it, you know, those stats that I spoke of at the start, don't discount those. They are enormous. And they're not because of any particular one initiative. It's because literally uh, the hundreds of thousands who live in this city have decided to make uh, their commitment to remaining in this city and in many cases are doing things differently to the way they used to do them. And that, yep, that changed. I think the gentleman up there who spoke about uh, growth through adversity, I think there is something in that. Uh, but we are very grateful that you have been willing to come here tonight and tell us uh, the problems as you see them. Uh, I'm very grateful. I want to thank the uh, gathering here tonight. Uh, they're all people who have very, very busy lives and are very focused on getting a good result here in Canterbury, either through their, their own uh, company or their uh, undertaking, uh, whether it's from Roger right through to uh, MB with their, their housing stuff. Uh, and I think um, the willingness that they've also shown to come and sit here tonight and listen to people is admirable. So I think you deserve a round of applause. So can I just uh, close uh, with the, um, I was going to use an Arnold Schwarzenegger thing, but then it's got the Terminator con connotation, which I wouldn't like to use. But we will do this again, and hopefully the report back will be a little more positive. Thank you.